Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions – Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Will to Love group and is part of the Education and Love series. In the Session 1 Review, Conclusion and Homework presentation, Jesus reviews and concludes the Analyze My Desire to Love and Change session and gives some homework to the participants for the following day. Recorded on the 21st of February 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. It's lovely to see a few of you connect there with that little session. Very nice. A bit more open. It's very good. Yeah, that's right. It's always good to get some uh, examples of what's going on. Yeah. Thank you, Avera, for, for that. And thanks, Lani, for your... Yep, my pleasure. All right. Well, we're almost uh, letting you out of jail for the next, after an hour now, so you've got a bit of freedom for a day. <laughs> but uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, what we thought the best thing to do would be before we let you go is to revise the two days. And we'll be doing this again on the next day we come back right in the morning, revising this two days so that just some things stick in your mind. What you normally find is if you can revise it a couple of times, some things will be fairly solid in there for, for you to work upon later. So what I'm going to do is basically revise uh, what we've presented with you already with regard to our developing our will to love. So let's cast our mind back to the very first presentation we did in the morning yesterday. Can you remember what the main, point, uh, main points of that presentation were? Right. If we start with Teresa out the, Teresa out the back. Thanks. Uh, we want, if we want an education, we need to get a higher source of a higher source than ourselves or the world, because yeah. the world isn't in a very good state at the moment. Yes, so it has to be a higher source. Yeah. So that's very important to remember. You want education from the higher source. You certainly don't want to be educated from people who are in the same position as yourself, because basically that's just going to be a, a, a sideways shift, <laughs> isn't it? There's no. There's no real education in that when it comes to love in particular. And, and also when it comes to truth, you need to have people or someone who knows more than you do about something to be educated in that particular thing. So it makes sense that if you want education in love and truth, then you're going to have to find somebody who knows more truth and find somebody who has more love than what you do in order to get educated. Now, the person with the highest source of love is God. So the higher source is God. That's, that's the person we want to connect to and, and receive love from and receive an education in love from. That's the person. That needs to be my focus. If I really want to be educated, that needs to be my focus. And receiving love from anybody else is lovely, but, but it doesn't guarantee that you're going to receive more truth than you currently know and it doesn't actually guarantee you're going to be loved more than you currently are capable of loving yourself. It's only through receiving it from the higher source that you will improve in those two capacities. Very important under underlying truth. Is there anything else that uh, struck you from, from that original presentation? Is we, we raised an issue regarding, remember, the definitions of love and what did we learn about that can you remember yeah if we yep yep thanks <laughs> thanks linda um well, basically that we're so far removed from the truth in our definitions of love that we have really no idea and what we think is the truth is yep. actually very, very wrong from yeah. God's perspective. Yeah. So in reality, the definitions of love almost completely oppose each other, remember. So this is something that we need to, to understand is that we need to receive a different definition 
of love. Because, it, because it, God's definition of love almost completely opposes, and remember we mentioned a few of the oppositions, like things like we would expect God to come and rescue the people who are being harmed on earth. God doesn't do that. But if God's the pinnacle of love, why doesn't God do that? There's got to be some reason. If we, we would expect God, you know, we, we often say to ourselves, if I was God, I would go and do this over there. Right, and God's not doing it, so that tells me straight away that the definition of what of what I think God should do is very, very different to what God feels God should do, and that tells me that there's obviously very, very different definitions of love going on. What I think is love, obviously, from God's perspective, is not, and what God thinks is love, obviously, from my perspective, is not. So almost we have opposite definitions, almost opposite definitions. Yep. Sure. I, had, I, I was talking to a friend a bit about divine truth, and they asked me, "What is God's love?" Uh, I was. I realized I, after watching hours and hours of video, I realized, like, wow, I don't know. I, yeah. <laughs> and and how is there a definition like a, a like a two line definition? Yeah. Well, what do you feel when you love someone else? You adore them, you, yeah. what else? You have affection for them, what else? Sorry? Spend time. spend time, you want to spend time with them. You, yeah, don't use those t words like unconditional because most of you have no idea what that means anyway. So, like, so my suggestion is when you love somebody, you adore them, you, if you have affection for them. Mm -hmm. You want, you want to give them everything that they would ever desire. You desire to, to, to have their lives happy and, and joyful and, and pleasurable. Well, that's what God wants for you. That's God's love for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's great. Thank yeah, you. It's exactly what God wants for you. Uh, Eloisa, thanks. Um, another one for the education was um, about our, we have to let go of our arrogant belief that we even know what love is. Yes, so that, that's a, that's a key thing, isn't it? Yeah. Letting go of our own ideas and concepts about it. You can't receive a education in love from somebody who who knows something completely different than you do about love without first giving up giving up the idea that maybe you don't know anything about uh, that whatever you think you know about love might be completely the opposite of what you're now going to learn from that particular person it's a bit like it's a bit like you going into a school to learn about electronic engineering and you think you know everything about electronic engineering already and and and, and yet what you know about was actually biology right <laughs> But you think it's called electronic engineering, and 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 so they start teaching you things. That's not electronic engineering, and, and and they're saying yes, it is, yes, it is, and you go no, no, it's not, no, it's not, and that's how we treat things with God a lot. We go no, it's not, no, it's not, no, it's not like that at all. Love's not like that at all. Truth's not like that at all. It's not like that at all. What's God talking about? God doesn't know what God's talking about, and that's our arrogance, isn't it? Our arrogance, yep, is a problem. So, Willem. I, when you were sharing um, how you first started discovering or connecting with God mm -hmm. uh, in your first century, I, it really highlighted for me how simple the process is. Yeah. How, how simple it can be if we let it. It can be. It can be, yeah. And, and this is the advantage I had, obviously, in the first century, was that, is that um, all, a lot of these emotional impediments that you have and that I now have... Um, uh, I didn't have then, so so I didn't have all of these like long-term blockages of, you know, not receiving truth or not receiving love. I, I was I was completely into receiving truth about anything, including myself, and and I wanted to, you know, to receive love. So I, I didn't have those blockages that the average person had at the time in my first century life. Obviously, one of the reasons why I came back was uh, I wanted to experience what it was going to be like having the blockages, and uh, and. <laughs> And it's not very nice, is it? <laughs> no. Okay. 
you know what I feel is a sad thing though is that as it is that I'm the only person who's never received who's who's ever known what it's like to not have the blockage on earth mm. so so I, I know both the contrast of both and trust me once you've re done it one way the contrast of the other way feels immensely painful but um so in some ways I'm glad that you don't know the contrast because you'd actually be in more pain than you currently are knowing it. Um, but but um, it is sad that the majority of people on this planet never have that experience of growing up in that wonderful way of not where, where we're not being affected by some worth-based issue that's affecting how we make our choices and decisions and reject things from God. So that's a... It's a wonderful thing to be able to have that experience, but it's not a wonderful thing to contrast it, trust me. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. But that's the potential, isn't it? That's why you made this yeah. amazing choice to come back. Yes, it's a potential of humanity. You know, within a few generations, we could be having children who can have that experience. And, and you imagine that. Like, you imagine children who 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 by the time they're sort of six seven eight ten years of age they know far more than anybody else on the planet because they've had no impediment to doing so and when you when you think of that you can also see that the it, it makes you more sensitive to the pain that you're in which it, which is actually a good thing right mm -hmm. Because you, we need to be sensitive to the pain we're in because if we're not sensitive enough to it we won't change it we won't change it there's so much potential mm -hmm. and yet hardly any of it realised because of that problem. Yeah. But, but this is the gift that we have, the potential of giving future generations is Exa to, to be the ones that spearhead this growth. Exactly. And, you, know, you imagine the rewards of that, uh, knowing that you were a part of, of making a change that completely changed the way the, the the generations and generations of people in the future address things and and the way the world operates. So th this is this is some of the rewards that you're not yet appreciating in the position you're currently in, because you're going through traumas and you're feeling pain and so forth. You're not yet appreciating the potential rewards. Yeah. And I'm completely aware of the potential rewards, but and we're going to go through some of those rewards in a few days' time, actually, just to help you with that. Yeah. Yep. Didn't you say as well as sometimes God doesn't act to give us the opportunity? Um, no. Well, I feel I feel God always acts, but but not the way in which we expect. And part of the action is that we need to take opportunities to correct our own causal things that we, you know, things that we cause. So, so part of this is part of this discussion. We were talking about humankind have caused huge amounts of problems on this planet, and yet none of us want to take responsibility for what we've caused, right? And God's giving us an opportunity, and, and in fact, God demands of us actually that we fix the things we broke because god god sees that as as an an effect of free will god can't fix the things we broke we broke god can only fix the things god broke if god ever broke anything because that would be a self what a self-responsible person would do so god's not going to fix things that you broke or i broke or the world generally collectively broke we are going to have to fix those things we are yep so very, it's a very important lesson of self-responsibility that's why god doesn't do it yep. okay so that was our talk discussing the education source now why was that important well it was important because we're here to gain an education in love and we want to make sure that we're getting the education from the best source it's no good getting an education and finding out in 10 years, 20 years' time. The whole lot was crap. 
the whole lot was false. What do I do then, you know? And imagine the disappointment of all that. Like, it'd be terrible. So we need to get the education in love from the source of the education, of all education. And, and that means not connecting to Jesus or anything like that, but connecting to the source. Just like Jesus has done, you need to also do, connect to the source. The source will give you the education. Right? And all I'm showing you is what I've learnt about how to connect to the source in order to receive the education. And I've been sharing with you some of the things that I've been educated in so that you get a bit of a glimpse of the future of what you might get educated in if you connect to the same source. Do you follow? But at the end of the day, we all need to individually connect to that source and no other source is going to be satisfactory. Right. There's helpers, they can help us, but they're not going to be satisfactory as connecting to the best source for truth, the best source of love, the best source of our education. All is with God. All right, so that was the main points we covered there. Then, then we went on to that next discussion, remember? How we feel about love. Now, can you remember why we raised the question about how we feel about love. What was the reason why we had to analyse that question? Can you remember? Yep, if we come down to Barbara. To show us that we um, had it all back to front and it was um, all of our education that we would received through our family and our environment and not through God. Yes. But, but didn't we also do it for another reason? What, what, what was the main reason? Can you remember the main reason? So I'll just write this here down, how I feel about love. Um, Diane, thanks. Just on this side. So we... Oh. <coughs> so we... <laughs> Come to see the truth of what we really feel. Yeah, and not because and not what we think we feel. Yeah, because we can't turn it around unless we're willing to see the truth and feel the truth. Yeah. <laughs> and remember, one of the things we did there was I asked you, how do you feel about God? And remember, we listed a whole heap of things about how you felt about God. And then when we realised... Well, actually, God's none of those things, so why do you believe God's all those things? And what, what was the result of that question? Wasn't it that, oh, that's our family of origin that taught us all those things about God, right? So, so the question of how I feel about love, I feel um, this, is a, this is an aspect. Um, I've spent many, many years of my life examining this, of course. And, and I, I think... I think when I first made a list about this particular question, I, I wrote 40 pages of single line feelings of how I felt about love, how I felt about God, how I felt about love of self, how I felt about love of others, and, and so forth. And, and then what I did is I did it in a table. So what, what I did is I drew a table like this, and I wrote how I feel on one side, and then I wrote how... I think God feels in terms of what is God's truth about that, right? This is how I feel. This is what I feel God's truth is about that particular thing. And I, I just wrote tables, pages and pages of it. So like one of the things I wrote is I, how I feel. Um, I, want to be, I want to be loved, I wrote. And then on this side I wrote down, oh, no one has to love me. Huh, that was pretty confronting. That took me a while to, <laughs> to cry about that one. You understand why? Basically what I'm having to confront there is that actually no one on this planet has to love me. And in fact, even God doesn't have to love me. That was pretty confronting to, to actually work through the fact that I desperately wanted to have, feel some love and yet nobody in this entire world or in this entire universe has to love me and that might mean 
that actually in the end nobody does. Right? It, 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 no, notwithstanding all of my development or all of my desire for truth, whatever, it might end up at the end of that that nobody loves me. How does that feel to you? Uh, it doesn't almost feel devastating. Right? Well, I was devastated by that. That took me months of, of crying to work through that one thing. Right? And then I got used to the co concept because I felt like, well, no, that's what love is. Nobody has to love you. They desire to love you or they don't desire to love you. It helped me work out what love was. It helped me understand that love is a gift. And it helped me understand too that when I receive that gift from somebody, I should appreciate it because, because gee, it's not, it's not like it's every day that you get that gift. Right? Just that one thing. And so, so this is what I feel you need to allow yourselves to do. Allow yourselves to feel about how you feel about love and look at how you feel and think about how you think what, or what you think you know from what you've learned about how God feels. Contrast the two and then let yourself feel about the contrast. Just let yourself feel about it. See, this, this was stopping me from seeing love as being a gift. You understand? To me, love was something I could demand. Once I worked my way through that emotionally, I could feel, no, actually love is a gift. If somebody loves you, it's just a wonderful thing and it's a gift. It's a gift. You don't even have to love them back. And if they truly loved you, they wouldn't even expect you to love them back. But it's highly unlikely you won't. <laughs> because it's such an, a beautiful gift, isn't it? Like, gee, beautiful gift. So if you make lists of these kind of things, and ha it may take you months to work through the feelings, but at least you know the truth about how you feel about love, and you're honest with yourself about it. You know? I demand to be loved. Many of you feel that you can demand to be treated well. It's a, it's a particular problem in the Western world. Yep. That you can demand to be treated well. If somebody doesn't treat you well, you're shitty with them, right? You're angry with them. You're really annoyed with them. In many cases, if, we're, if we get to the point where we're resentful of them and we want to hurt them even, right? That, that demonstrates the demand to be loved, right? Someone leaves you who you want to love you, how does that feel? Uh, most people get very angry about that, <laughs> right? You know, if it's a woman who has the children with her, she'll, she'll keep the kids away from him and everything. She'll do as much as she can to make his life miserable, right? That's an indication that she already believed that love was a demand. It's a gift. It's a gift. Yep. Another one I had was that human love was better than is better than God's. <laughs> and what I had to come to learn was that actually human love is fickle, you know, it's like it just depends on how the person feels on the day. <laughs> really, a lot of the times. One day they love you, the next day they hate your guts. They do. Isn't that the case? Isn't that how you felt about others sometimes? One day you love them and the next day you think, oh, I don't like them at all. That's how fickle human love is. But when you receive God's love, God's love's not fickle. It doesn't change. It's not changeable like that. Right? It, it, it's permanent. A and it's consistent. So I had to work through the fact that actually, no, God's love is perfectly consistent. Right, so, so what I had to come to terms with is that, yeah, God actually agrees with that. <laughs> but, but, sorry, when I say God agrees, God agrees that God, human love is fickle. So, so I had to come to the stage of, to understand the truth. So I come to see that actually if I wanted people to love me then I was wanting fickle people to give me something 
And how was I going to do that? It's pointless, isn't it? Like, really, in the end. <laughs> so I had to give up trying to earn love. Uh, and then that helped me with another a truth, and that is that you, love can't be earned, actually. <laughs> but can you see, if you, if you allow yourself to look at these particular things, you, you'll find the truth rapidly, and you'll also be able to feel about these particular things. What I'm encouraging you to do is do that. Feet just down the front, thanks, Eva. <coughs> um, I did this recently, this table about my feelings about love and hmm. so many false beliefs about love. Like, yep. I was overwhelmed. It surprised me just how far it went. Yeah. So, what did, so I look at that table and I, I feel like, where do I even begin? Because I feel like these beliefs really block this yeah, whole they, path. Um, they do block. So, so where do you begin? Well, I don't know because I kind of look at it and I go, oh, do I just look at the first one and, it, <laughs> and just pray about that and spend all my time kind of going, but then I don't know how I'm ever going to get through it. <laughs> yeah, what, what I have a tendency to do is more prioritise them in terms of what's going to have the fastest benefit to my life. So, so for example, anything that affects my relationship with God is going to have a faster impact on my life than anything else. So what I try to do first is focus first on those particular problems, whatever those problems are. And then I look at anything that affects my soulmate relationship as next, anything that affects, and that's including love of self. So love of self and love of soulmate, that's next. Anything that affects my love for others is next and so forth all the way down the yeah. chain. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so I don't, I, my priority system is based upon, and I think myself and Mary did a feedback, uh, a question and answer session recently about, yeah, we did about um, Jesus' dealings, and Ma Jesus and Mary's dealings it was. We did a, 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 a FAQ about what our priority system is, and basically what we try to do is, is deal with our emotions based around that priority system as well. Does that make sense? And did you find, like, if you started to really focus on one of your false beliefs about God, for example, love to do with God, that even just working through that, maybe you got truths about the other ones. You always do. Yeah. You always do. That's the way it works. Yeah. But see, 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 remember, the only reason why truths are not flowing into your soul from God is because you're rejecting them. So the more you open your heart to God's truth about any issue, obviously that gives you a greater opening to other truths about other issues. So what, what has a tendency, a list you might make today might be very short because you're not that open. And then you come back to that same list in a year's time, you go, gee, I could now write a hundred things in there, you know, like, and you then think that that's not, that's not improvement, but it is improvement because you're now becoming aware of things that you weren't aware of before. Yep. Yep, thank you. Yep. Okay, so then we focused on this other issue. Um, Gotta just rub that out <laughs> of how I feel about change. Now, why do, why do we focus on that issue? Can you remember, Josh? Thanks. Because that's what needs to happen. <laughs> that's what needs to happen, and and not only does it need to happen, it's like. It's inevitable that it's going to happen, isn't it? It's like, well, what are we trying to fight it for? It's, it has to happen. <laughs> and, uh, and this is the problem we have, isn't it? We're here trying so hard to keep everything nice and smooth and consistent. And, and God's, saying, God's saying, no, no, no. I want you to change every single day. Every single day I want you to be different. Right? You imagine that, you imagine that getting up one morning looking in the mirror. <laughs> And you can't even recognise your own face anymore. That would be a bit of a that would be a bit of a weird thing, wouldn't it? Fortunately, God's probably not going to do that to you. But <laughs> but but it is like that emotionally, and it also is like that with your life. Like there are there are times you wake up and your life has totally changed because of something you've just done yesterday, something something you've just worked through yesterday, and your attractions today are just completely different, and you can feel that different too. You feel everything is different. You feel your relationship with your partner is different. Your relationship with the world is different. You can feel things are going to change for you now. You can feel the excitement of that building. It's just wonderful when you work through, uh, like when you love change. It's just wonderful. So we have to get from, from feeling afraid of change to loving change. To loving it. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Some of you may feel that's a long way off, but, but the reality is you need to firstly deal with your emotions regarding change in order for love of change to, to develop. Isn't that right? So, so what emotions did we identify for many of you were the primary emotions? Wasn't it just mostly fear and, and lack of faith and things like that? Just lack of faith, fear, fear, fear of taking action, resistance to truth. They were the primary reasons why you don't want to change and, or that you feel you don't need to, arrogantly believe that you don't need to. So um, we raised in that talk the four primary issues, uh, you know, and let's just go over them again, even though I've just mentioned some of them. Issue number one. You can yell them out if you want. No. So lack of faith. So faith is issue number one. Why, why is faith issue number one, do you think? Can you, can you answer that? Eloisa, thanks. Without faith, you're not going to change at all. Yeah, so, so you've got to believe in something beyond where you're at at the moment, don't you? Yeah. In order to actually change. And if you believe there's no benefit for change, then of course you're not going to change. So you have to actually have a belief that there is good that comes out of change. Yeah. Right? Now, remember we, we talked about that in that when, you're a, when we're a, a child, there is a constant belief that change is good, is there? And the parents even believe that change is good at that moment. You know, th nobody wants to be wiping the bottom of a 20-year-old person and cleaning up their nappy after them, right? So, so basically, we know that, that change is good when we're growing up. But the, remember we talked about this, how by the time we reach adulthood, we are so in this state of wanting to conform to the rest of the world and the rest of the existence that what we finish up doing is we become afraid of change. And, and remember I gave the illustration, if, imagine yourself putting yourself on a, on, a, on a tropical island with the other half of yourself without anybody else there to influence your choices and decisions. I'm sure you'd be happy to change or more happy to change than you currently are. And this is, a, this is the indication that most of us are afraid of other people and what they think when it comes to change as well. So we need to give that up. All right, so faith, faith is a very important thing to develop. We're going to spend a, a more time on that in two days' time. Okay, what was next? If we go over the corner there to Mary. Uh, just wait for the mic, Mary. Yep. It's coming towards you. Fear of emotion. Fear of emotion, yes. So, so next point is emotion. We're afraid of emotion. Now, why is that important? Well, firstly, you know, love is an emotion. Like, it's pretty hard to feel love if you can't feel emotion. But also because, uh, as, I, as I illustrated from my first century life, I started to realise in my first century life that, that people were motivated to do some ugly things and every time they were motivated to do something that was really ugly, there was always an emotional reason for it, right? And I also noticed that people were motivated sometimes to do some very kind things and always when they were motivated there was a Emo another emotion that motivated them to do some kind things. And in fact, I r drew some illustrations from that. Like you heard the illustration of the prodigal son and the illustration of the man who was on the road to... Uh, um <laughs> to where? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that was after my death. <laughs> yeah. No. It, it was the road to Jericho, and 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 how the man, the, uh, the illustration of the Good Samaritan, it's called, and and how a, a person he was willing to go to the nth degree to help another person, right? So there, we can. It's emotion that motivates both kinds of action, a good action, a positive action, no matter what opposition to somebody to do something positive, but it's also emotion that causes people to do negative things. So obviously, I realise that what we've got to learn to do is get rid of the emotions that drive the negative behaviour and embrace the emotions that drive the positive behaviour. To get rid of an emotion, you have to feel it. So you have to feel the emotion to 
get rid of it. So very important, be letting yourself have this development emotionally, become more sensitive emotionally, very important part of change. We're terrified of it. Humankind terrified of it. Yeah, I watch movies nowadays and I get so tired of them. Uh, it's very rare now for me to watch a movie because you, you have all these people with all their understated emotion. You notice that? It drives you batty, <laughs> uh, particularly when you're emotional. Okay, what's next? So, just cry. Get it over and done with. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what you feel. So, like, yell at them. <laughs> and that's, then you realise, oh, it's just an actor. <laughs> <laughs> what's next? Thanks. Not taking action. Not taking action, Janine. Yep. So, so it's write it down. Just one word: action. Right. The amount of time that we we refuse to act upon what we know, it's shocking, really. It's shocking. And and we need to address it. And uh, and the refusal to take action often causes us to remain in places for years and years and years that we don't have to be in. Remember I raised today with Lani in our session how she needs to take action to confront the fears head on. Take action to put herself in the situation she's afraid of rather than the other way around. Right? Within reason. It has to be loving. So she wouldn't put herself in an unloving situation just to get triggered. She puts herself in a situation that's loving, with a loving motivation, and she takes some action, she'll actually get to the bottom of the fear. And if she, if she breathes and feels, she'll feel through it. Right? It's a normal pro process, but we're so afraid of taking action. We, we'll, we'll almost live a life of total stagnation for 60 or 70 years in order to not take action. We will. You know, many of you have had 10, 20 years of your life go by single, without anybody in your life. That's because you don't want to take action on that issue. Right? It's just, we do it all the time. We do it. We're willing to, to lay in bed, right, for, for 10 years with cancer before we die in extreme pain. That's how willing we are to not take action. There's people who do that all the time. Right? My, my grandmother laid in bed for, for 11 years before she died. 11 years. Right? Wasn't with cancer. She, she, she got Alzheimer's. She was afraid to go anywhere. And so she stayed in bed 11 years. Watch telly. Right? We're willing to do that rather than remember how we feel about things. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of not wanting to take action and not wanting to feel, isn't it? Yeah, it's, ter it's terrible for us. And the last one was? Resistance to truth, yeah. Very important part. So again, if we, uh, instead of talking about it negatively, let's talk about it positive. Of it, truth, right? We need to come to understand this relationship between love and truth. We need to get it. We need to understand that the two are joined together. We can't separate one from the other. You can't receive love unless you're willing to receive truth. You can't give love unless you're willing to give truth. You can't. Stop thinking you can. Stop thinking you love each other when you're withholding information from each other. You're not. That's not loving anybody. Right? It's all lies if you think that. And we need to get away from that. Now, if, if we embrace these things, then change is inevitable. But the, the little word... <laughs> ..is actually a big word. Right? Isn't it? And the if is the decision that you make. It's the choice you make. That's how you use your will. Right? So when you develop your will to love, you will look at that if and go, yeah, if I do that, th these things, if I do these things, something will result. I'm going to do them. 
And I'm not going to use excuses or anything else. Now, then we came to this morning and we decided to, oh, okay, we need to examine things a bit, don't we, in terms of how and why I remain unloving. I just wrote that here in blue. Right. And really it got down to what? Well, firstly, 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 what did we look at in terms of the attitude? The attitude a lot was to do with excuses, was it? Or denial. What else? Justification. Justification. Minimization, so minimize. Blame, yes. All right? So we excuse, deny, justify, minimize, and blame for what? In what areas? Well, are the areas of the four areas, weren't they? We, we excuse, deny, justify, minimize, and blame our lack of faith without realising that actually I'm responsible for developing faith. Like, it's my faith, it belongs to me, I'm the person responsible for developing it. Right? What else was it? Fear, dealing with our fear, so fear, action and truth. Those things. So, so again, we do all of those things and then we say, we throw up our hands and we say, it's not my fault. I ask for God's love every day and I don't get it. It's not my fault. I'm doing everything I can. Pretty arrogant position, but that's what we do. So we choose to make unloving choices and decisions. We do. We need to stop doing it, don't we? And when it got down to it, there was really one primary thing. And I'd probably like to just read it out. The real reason I remain unloving is because I want to remain unloving. <laughs> yeah, I want to remain unloving. And the reason why I want to remain unloving totally confuses me. It does. I, I got no idea why you want to remain unloving. It's confusing. It's no sense because, because it's not very pleasurable. It's not. It doesn't result in a lovely life or anything. All it does is we look at the world and that's what we're getting, isn't it? We look at the world and we need to look at the world because that's exactly a reflection of what we're getting from what we're doing. We look at the world and there's wars and there's, you know, there's all this trauma and problems. There's millions of people dying, millions of children dying every year. There's all these terrible things happening and we go, oh... I still want to remain unloving. We've got to start seeing it as a personal choice, don't we? Personal decision. Phoebe? <coughs> Sorry, I'm a bit over time, guys, but... It'll be quick. Um, just with the action, taking action, mm -hmm. like, what if, if you're not 100% sure of what the, the loving thing to do is in a situation, is it better just to act... Like if, if you're not acting, not doing something that's obviously unloving. Yep. Um, Ask someone else who you think is more loving than you are. So say you're just like in a situation though and you're engaging with someone and like sometimes I'm not fully aware of the addictions that are going on if I'm meeting an addiction or receiving one. Mm -hmm. Like in that situation, you know, sometimes I... If you're unsure, remove yourself from the situation. Go and find somebody who you think is in a more loving condition than you are on that particular subject. Ask them. If there's no one around who is in a more loving condition than you are, ask God. And remember, if you're not receiving an answer from God, it's because you don't want it. Yeah. <laughs> so that is the action to take. Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. Thank yeah. you. There's plenty of people who want to help you. Remember, there's all these spirits who want to help you. There's people on earth who want to help you. But uh, it just depends on, on whether you really want the answers or not, right? Josh? <coughs> uh, just right next to you. Okay, can you leave your hand up, Josh. Mm. Um, I'm just stuck on um, acting on what I know. 
because uh, I feel that I, I'm, I have confusion about what I know versus what I don't know, basically. So I just... Um, no, you prefer to have confusion about what you know and what you don't know. Right, yeah. Why? Because it gets me off the hook of acting. Correct. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yep. Remember, we, this is the way our mind works. Our mind, we, we, our mind is there to just respond to the soul's desire. The soul is saying, I don't want to act, I don't want to act. So the best way to not act is to be in doubt, to be in confusion, is to not choose, is to not decide what to do. That's the best way to get out of it. So you do that. That's a fear, isn't it? Yep, Elvira? Um, my problem is I think everyone's more loving than me and then I listen to them. Sorry, your problem is? I, I think everyone's more loving than me and then... Everyone's I, what? Then you're not hearing you clearly for some reason. What? More loving than you. Yeah, and then because like I get confused about stuff and then I think, oh, I've got no way of working this out and then I'll talk to somebody else or listen to somebody else. Yeah. And then I always believe it. Yeah, and then you've learnt that everyone isn't more loving than you, haven't you? <laughs> well, no, I don't always because... I think you have. You've asked a lot of people and put your trust in people only to find out that they haven't proven to have the answers as much anywhere near what you have anyway, right? So what's the put? Why do you ask them? Why do you ask somebody something that that in the past they've proven to you they're incapable of answering? Because most of you do that all the time. I've seen you do it. You, you, you go up and ask somebody who's in total addiction how to deal with your addiction. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> like, you, you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, look, I feel like there's very few people now who I trust. Yeah, there is. There's very few people who are trustworthy. But you, why is that? Because the majority of people respond only to their unhealed emotional state. And that means that on one day they'll do one thing with one person and the next day they'll do a completely opposite thing with a different person just because of their emotional state. So that makes them untrustworthy, doesn't it? Who's trustworthy? Well, that, that, that's like before when you said to somebody, you know, find somebody who's in a better condition than you. Yeah, well, if you know there's no one in a condi better condition than you, there's somebody else that is in a better condition than you. Who's yeah, that? Well, I've been thinking I really need to just take everything to God. Of course you do. The best way. Of course you do. And also you've got celestial spirits you could ask. But again, you've got to know, you've got to feel enough to know that they're actually celestial spirits that you're asking. Well, that's my big dilemma. I don't trust that at all. No, well, I understand why. Because you're not letting yourself feel everything. Because whenever you try to feel something and God's trying to help you feel things, you shut it down. So, of course, you're not going to trust your feelings. You're shutting down your feelings. You can't trust feelings that you're shutting down. You follow? So, this is, this is the thing. It's like we, we often berate ourselves for actions taken which are actually the effects of a whole series of other things that we've decided to do way before then that we're not looking at at all right at this stage the majority of you do not know or understand the power of feeling your own emotion you don't understand that you're able to easily read other people's emotion as well as your own this makes you know who you can trust and who you can't trust yeah, you understand? See, this is my big dilemma too. Can I keep? Like, <laughs> yeah, go on. I I actually quite often do feel people quite strongly. No, you don't. You I feel don't. you feel the unhealed part of the person yeah, quite that's strongly. True. Yeah, the that's not feeling part. the whole person. Oh, okay. That's only feeling the part that interacts with your unhealed emotions. So uh, that's where I'm getting it wrong. Most people on the planet do that. Yeah. That's not a correct assessment of the person. So, so you think some people are good who are actually not good. You think they're good because they appeal to certain addictions inside of you that make you feel that they're good. You understand? And until you purify that with God's help, you won't know the difference. You just won't. So there's, there's people who come up to me and go, oh, I just want to help you, and, blah, 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 and, and they tell a big story about how much they want to help. And I say, look, I don't believe anything you're saying to me. 
and I say this is why and I tell them why and then the next moment they are in an absolute rage with me they'll walk away and they'll do everything they possibly can to destroy me and, and, and they're proving to me exactly what I felt from them do, do you see what I'm saying? right because you can feel once you can feel everything in a person you can feel the different emotions that are going to trigger different things you can feel what they're going to choose to do under certain circumstances do you see but you can't do that yet because you're not yet letting yourself feel all of your own emotions so you're not going to be able to do that with other people so this is why it's essential that you do, you start opening to god and you focus on that relationship first where your education in love comes from and you develop that first that's what I have had to develop first when you develop that first you work through a whole heap of things emotionally now you're able to have valid interactions with other people that are actually in harmony with truth that you actually know is the truth but only then until then you're blind people and when you go up to another person, you're often going up to a, another blind person. Right? And therefore, what will happen? The blind will lead the blind. And if you're willing to be led, people want to lead you. <laughs> Whether they're blind or not, they'll want to lead you. And where will they lead you? <laughs> yeah. So my, my suggestion is, yes, focus first like you've been doing, Elvira, on your relationship with God. Look at those blockages to God's love flowing into your heart and, and deal with your emotions, allow yourself to emotionally expand. Then you will become more and more sensitive to what's really going on. Now, there are times when you are now sensitive to what's going on because I've seen you comment about certain things on different forums and whatever and I can see that you have commented you know, accurately about what's going on where other people haven't seen it but we've got to remember that that until we've released a lot of our emotions it's going to be very hard to accurately determine how other people feel let alone how we feel like once you can determine how you feel accurately on a lot of different issues then you start have a hope of doing it for with with other people yep but that doesn't stop you from sharing truth does it Truth's always present. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we've got some homework for you, right? Of what we would like to give you. So, so let's give you some homework. Now, it's pretty obvious what the homework's probably going to be, right? Yeah. What do you think it's going to be? We're looking at this question here. So I would like you to write down your feelings about love how do i the question is how do i personally feel about love i want you to be honest with yourself about it now many of you feel like rejecting love many of you feel like love will overpower you many of you feel like love will ch change your life but but mean that you have to you know conform to other people's desire demands and desires and so there's all sorts of things you feel let yourself ask yourself that question but also ask yourself in the terms of how do you feel about god's love this is a very important question how you feel about god's love right so so what i'd like you to do maybe is to separate the two lists one list how i feel about god's love another list how i feel about uh, human love like and you could even separate the human love up if you wanted to be more specific, couldn't you? Into uh, love with my partner, love with my friends and cho or children and so forth. And love of the world generally. You could separate that up if you wanted to. But you really want to examine your feelings. And the question I want to ask you is, is note down whether you feel like you're honest about whether you really want to experience those feelings or whether you've been trying to avoid those feelings do you see what i'm saying so do, do you want to feel the feelings or avoid them be honest about that and do you want to feel them rather than talking about them 
like I see a lot of you want to talk about them, but, but when it comes to actually feeling them on a personal level in the privacy of your own space, you don't want to feel them. So that tells me there's a lot of addiction in the feeling of feelings. So you, so you need to examine how much addiction you have in the feeling of your feelings. Uh, that you want other people to share with you, to encourage you, to, to be your cheer squad and all those kind of things. Right? None of those things are necessary. And in fact, they're all going to harm your development. Okay, so that was the first one. How do I personally feel about love? Am I actually willing to feel those feelings? The next one is pretty much the same about change. So how do I feel about change? What's my personal feelings about change? Be honest about them. And do, am I willing to feel those feelings? Now, one way to feel the feelings of change is to actually make the change and then feel the feeling. Isn't it? You could choose to do that. Make the change, then feel the feeling. So, so is, are there things in your life that you could instantly change, but you've been avoiding the change because of all sorts of addictive emotions, and are there things you could now instantly change, uh, but you're just avoiding change because you don't want to go through the feelings? Uh, you know you should, but you don't want to. And the third thing is... What are my personal methods for remaining unloving? And, uh, and in that one, the presentation outline that we gave you will give you a lot of help, helpful pointers if you want to go through them. All right. And, but, but we want to know, you want to, you want to be able to analyse yourself and your personal feelings. Now, now, please do not get judgmental. Right? Judgment is going to prevent you from ever resolving any of these things. Right? Also, please, there's no need for you to feel guilty. Right? Guilt is just going to help you do the same thing over and over again. Right? You need to stop feeling guilty and want to find the feeling. That's what we need to do. Investigate. Be open to investigation. Right, what we'll be doing is having a very short, probably, uh, probably be 20 minutes or 25 minutes on um, Tuesday, it is, isn't it? Um, review of your homework, of what, what you found. And it will be very short, so we, we will have to be very specific with our, with our question and answers there. When then we're going to do a short review of the last two days again, just to remind you of where we're up to. And then we're going to get into those four issues of faith, you know, fear, action and truth. And we want to get into those four issues and see how each one of those issues affect the use of our will. So that's where we're headed. All right. So enjoy your day off and please do some of that homework and, uh, and enjoy the surrounds we're in. They're lovely surrounds, aren't they? So uh, have, enjoy some of that and I'll see you 10.30 um, a.m. Tuesday morning. Oh,